This is Easy Does It Barbecue with your host, Dan McDonald, owner of Colorado Barbecue Outfitters. If you're ready to dig into some serious talk about all things barbecue, from the moo to the oink, grab a cold one and let's get down to business. Now, here's Dan McDonald. Hey everybody, this is Dan McDonald with Colorado Barbecue Outfitters, and you're listening to the Easy Does It Barbecue Radio Show on KPPF. We call it Easy Does It Barbecue because I'm going to tell you the easiest way to do it. Today's show, we're going to talk about barbecue myths. And yes, I've mentioned this before several times, but it's important. I want you to be educated on the scientific approach to barbecuing. You know, we all have that great grandpappy that did it a certain way, and once again, There is nothing wrong with that. But in a world of social media where we are all running to go share our food pictures and the way we did it and we're just happy when things come out and we like to share it on social media, I want to make sure that you don't come across possibly looking like the fool. And that can happen, unfortunately, on social media. So we're going to talk about today how to avoid doing that. So I'm just going to go down several barbecue and or grilling myths that I think some might surprise you. You probably have been doing a lot of these and don't feel bad. And if you want to continue to do them, once again, please do it. I always want to emphasize you cook the way you like to do it, but I want to give you some scientific approach behind it so you know what's going on behind the scenes. The myth. So here we go. I'm just going to start listing these myths out and we'll speak to each one. Each one of them is just as common and popular as the other one. Flipping steaks one time. So there's a myth out there that when you're cooking steaks, you should only flip them once. And that's quite a myth right there. Actually, the more often you flip the steak, the more done it is going to get. If you only flip a steak or a burger for that matter one time, you might end up with it being overdone on the outside and completely raw on the inside. So I always recommend that you flip off and there's nothing wrong with that. The myth. Heat, not oil, makes your cooking surface non-stick. That's a surprise. Most people, right, will take their grates and oil them up thinking that that's going to keep the meat from sticking. And it's really more of high heat or having those grates seasoned all along. The other thing I want to point out is never ever spray any kind of combustible material such as vegetable spray, olive oil spray, or anything like that over direct heat. Hopefully that that is something that's common sense that may cause a problem for you. So never spray anything on your cooking surface with the direct heat right under it. The myth. When we talk about barbecuing, one common myth is, and one question I get oftentimes during my classes are, Dan, should I soak my wood because it'll prolong the smoke or keep the wood from combusting? Everyone listen, first of all, water does not penetrate wood, but about 3% or we wouldn't have made boats out of it for thousands of years. So keep that in mind. The other thing is let's think back to about eighth grade science where they taught us wood combusts one way with the introduction of heat and with the introduction of oxygen. You take either one of those away and it's not going to combust. You add both of those and it's going to start to smolder and or combust. Now, you soak it in water, you're doing a couple things. You're adding more humidity to the inside of your cook chamber, which may lower the overall temp. The other thing is, is you're not going to get any smoke until that water vaporizes out of that wood. So if you want to delay your smoke, then that's a great way to do it. Now, I will tell you this, some smokers out there do recommend that you soak the wood. If your owner's manual to whatever you're cooking says to do it, then I encourage you to try it both ways. Try it the way they recommend, and then also try it without. You may find out that soaking wood is a complete waste of time. Same goes for those bamboo skewers that you use when you do kebabs. A lot of times they tell you to soak the wood to keep it from combusting. Well, guess what? When it's over the direct heat, that water is going to vaporize out rather quickly and the wood is going to burn up anyway. So you're not really helping your cause by soaking those skewers before you do kebabs over the grill. The myth. Some people think that putting salt on steak before you're grilling it is bad. They think that adding the salt 
will dry the meat out when ironically it actually does just the opposite. Now, you don't want to bathe your steaks in salt. First of all, that's going to be way too much sodium to consume. It's also going to ruin the flavor of the meat because all you're going to taste is salt. But a light sprinkling of salt just before you put it on the grill is the preferred way to do it. If you're grilling steak, now I'm not talking about large cuts of meat that you've heard me in the past talk about putting a salt rub on. We're talking about small cuts of meat being grilled right now. We basically just want to put a light light sprinkle of salt, maybe some pepper on it, and we'll do that right before we put it on. Uh, we won't really need to put that on much earlier than just a few minutes before we grill. The myth. Smoke rings. Boy, smoke rings are a big one. It used to be that people would, and I'm going to tell you what, folks, I'll admit it, I did the same thing. I would cook something and I would see that beautiful smoke ring around the outside of the meat and take a picture of it and post it on social media thinking, boy, check out my smoke ring. And then I learned over the years that a smoke ring is not even from the smoke, which is very ironic. What the smoke ring is, is you have nitric oxide from usually when wood is burning and carbon monoxide. And what that does is that meets up with the myoglobin, which is that red liquid that comes out of meat. By the way, that is not blood. And that's another myth that people say that is blood and I don't want that. That's myoglobin. That is just simply the juices that are in the muscle meat, uh, no matter what kind of cut that is. But when that, when those chemicals are released, and you can do this right in your oven, when those chemicals are released and meet with that myoglobin, that's that red ring you get on the outside. So it's really technically not from the compounds of smoke, ironically. It's very pretty, and I I encourage people to always share pictures of your success stories. That's what social media is for. But just know if you're going to brag about your smoke ring, there's going to be one or two people that are going to knock you down to size and say it means nothing. You cannot taste a smoke ring at all. The myth. I've mentioned this several times, and I want to bring this up again, that doing burn-offs on your grill, and what I mean by that is cranking your grill up to the hottest it'll go, over 500 degrees. Some people will crank it up to six, seven, eight hundred 800 degrees. And it's just silly to do that. All you're going to do is damage the grill. The metal is going to get so hot it will expand. And then when it cools, it might loosen. It's a good way to have uh, metal parts loosen and fall apart on your grill. You're only asking to damage your grill, folks. Do not do high temp burn-offs. They don't do anything. They don't really help at all. Uh, and they're just really not smart. You can hurt yourself. You can certainly damage your grill. I'm of the belief you really don't have to go over pretty much 500 degrees for just about anything that I'm aware of. The myth. This is one that really irks me. If anyone who's ever attended my class has heard me talk about food poisoning or bacteria in meat, and why is that so important to me? Well, because when I was younger, I got food poisoning and spent a couple days in the hospital, and it was a pretty bad case. And so it is something that's very particular with me. I don't ever want to go through that again, and I'd never want to have anyone that uh, enjoyed something I cooked go through it. The myth. One of the myths is set the meat out to room temperature before it goes on your grill or smoker. Right now, guys, I'm going to tell you larger cuts of meat, tri-tip, rib roast, pork shoulders, briskets, things like that. That is a ludicrous uh, rule to follow. First of all, an eight pound pork shoulder that you take out of a refrigerator, which is usually just under 40 degrees, is going to take hours and hours and hours to get to room temperature. And now that meat has been sitting in what I call the microbial danger zone. That's a good way to get people sick, especially if you are doing barbecue because your temperature is much lower than when you're grilling. Now, smaller cuts of meat, hamburgers, steaks like that, it's okay to set them out for a little bit, the theory is they're going to come to almost room temperature rather quickly because they're a small cut of meat. But again, you're not gaining anything, folks. Prep your meat however you like, whatever, whether that's an injection or a marinade or a dry rub or a brine or what have you. And it's fine to just throw it right over the heat. It's going to be subjected to heat right away anyway. So setting meat out to room temperature doesn't really do anything. And all it does is increase your chance of getting somebody sick. The myth. 
some of the quote-unquote pros that you may find online will often talk about they check the temperature of meat by how it feels. Now listen, guys, Gordon Ramsay, he's been doing this for decades. This guy has cooked more food than most of us do in three lifetimes. Yes, he's a professional. He's been doing this. He may be one of the very few people on this planet that can get away with checking temperature of meat by feeling his hand. If you take your fingers and touch the padded bottom part of your thumb, then typically they say that is rare, it's softer. And then as you go up the thumb till it, where it starts to get harder, they say that's more done. Guys, listen, don't bother with any of that. Get yourself a digital instant read thermometer. Come on down to Colorado Barbecue Outfitters and I carry everything you need. In the very least, I'll explain what you need, even if you purchase it somewhere else. But an instant read digital thermometer is the only true way to check temp. I'll argue that point till I'm blue in the face because again, it's a good way to ruin meat, either overcook it or undercook it. Get a digital thermometer. The myth. I want to talk about grades of beef. Beef comes in different types of grades. You have the lower grade, which quite frankly is probably hard to find unless you're buying meat at a dollar store, but that's select grade. Most of us don't buy select. Select is used in large quantities, maybe restaurants, things like that, where they're blasting through meat quite, quite quickly. It's a lot of times select is ground up and used as as a, a form of uh, ground beef or what have you. The next one that's very popular is choice. And that's what probably most of us purchase on a day-to-day -day basis. It's fairly reasonably priced. It tastes really good depending on your palate. Now I've always told everyone, my palate is not sense enough to tell the difference between choice or the next higher one, which is prime. I consider myself lucky and then I can save some money in that aspect and buy a lower graded choice piece of meat rather than prime. Now, if prime's on sale, you bet I'll get it, but it doesn't do any good for me to buy expensive meat because quite frankly, my tongue can't tell the difference. If you can, then great, more power to you. So remember your lowest beef grade is select, the middle is choice, and the top is prime. And then above that, you start getting into the really insane. You have Japanese Wagyu. That can get up to about $100 an ounce. So most of us don't, most of us don't have the income to buy that on a daily basis. And if you do, well, congratulations. You're listening to Easy Does It Barbecue. My name is Dan McDonald, owner of Colorado Barbecue Outfitters, and you're listening to Barbecue Myths. The myth. Flavoring the meat. That's another myth that is out there as far as different ways to flavor the meat. Again, guys, I'll never argue with anyone of what works. If you're a marinator, great. Continue to do it. If you like to just throw a little salt and pepper on the meat, very light, go with that. I like a little more flavor, so I do tend to add some garlic, salt or garlic powder, onions, whatever. I like to mix things up, but it's entirely up to you. Flavoring meat does not have to be done. Uh, some people prefer their meat with no spices whatsoever at all. Remember the salt and pepper spice is called the Dalmatian rub. It's the most popular one that everyone uses in our country. The myth. I mentioned before that I wince when I hear people do it. I don't correct them generally unless I'm in a class, but remember you do not barbecue burgers. You do not typically barbecue steaks. Now you can do what's called a reverse sear on both of them. And what that means is you're actually barbecuing and grilling. Let me explain. A reverse sear is a method of cooking where you, so let's say you have a couple ribeyes and you put them on your grill indirectly and you give them what I call a kiss of smoke. So for example, on my wood pellet grill, I can put them on around 225. It'll produce more smoke it'll impart a little bit of flavor to the meat. So a couple ribeyes, I would smoke them for about 30 minutes. Then what I do is I crank up the heat or I move them over to a very hot heat source, whatever that is. Could be a gas grill, could be charcoal, could be infrared, could be your broiler in your kitchen oven. And that's called a reverse sear. It's the probably most popular way to do, to sear uh, steaks or burgers. And if you haven't tried it, you got to get out there and give it a try. You probably won't 
ever go out for steak again if you do this, folks. The myth. Another famous myth in the barbecue slash grilling world is a well-used pit is what we call quote unquote seasoned. Folks, what they're talking about is if you use your grill and or your smoker, especially your smoker, because of the compounds that are released during cooking, you get what's called a buildup on the inside of the grill or smoker. And most of it is something called creosote. Creosote is nasty. It does not taste good at all. You do not want this getting dripping down onto your food. Creosote also more importantly is combustible. Now, do you have to scrape your grill or smoker right down to the bare metal? No, certainly not. But if the creosote builds up enough that you can start to scrape it off, and I mean over about maybe a quarter inch, it's time to maybe get some of that off. On the inside of your lid, creosote can flake and it almost looks like paint is coming off. We want to get that off simply because we don't want it dropping in our food. It's not going to taste good. That also can be combustible. So if you turn your grill or smoker up very hot, let's say you want to do a pizza in it, you turn it up hot, that creosote can turn into a grease fire. So it's not seasoned, folks. It's dirty and it needs to be cleaned. So let's just all remember that. The myth. There is a saying out there in the barbecue world that says, if you're looking, you ain't cooking. And what that refers to is if you go out, lift the lid and check on the meat periodically, that you're letting all the heat and moisture out and so on. And although that is true, folks, there's, there's an end to that that nobody ever finishes up with. And that is when you close that lid. So first of all, I have to ask, is there a reason you need to go out and look at the meat? Now, I'll give you a reason. During my cook, I like to rotate my meat. There are hot spots that tend to generate, especially when you're cooking with charcoal. You can have hot spots on part of your grill or smoker. It's a good idea to go out maybe once or twice, not a lot, and rotate your meat so that it's a little more evenly cooked. Yes, you will lose moisture and heat when you open that lid. That's true. It might drop 10 15, maybe even 20 degrees. But folks, guess what? When you do whatever you need to do with your meat, and by the way, your meat's never going to go anywhere. So if you're just going out to look at it, I would encourage you not to lift the lid in that case. But if you want to go out and let's say you want to rotate like I just talked about, when you open that lid and then close it, the moisture and the heat come right back up. So I'm not sure why most people are so concerned about letting that out. Now you're gonna go through more fuel, which could affect your pocketbook the more times you go out there. But a couple times of lifting the lid is not gonna hurt anything. When you close that lid in about 10 minutes, your smoker grill should be right back to the temperature it was. If it's not, push it by the curb and come see me for a new one. The myth. We've talked on previous shows about competition barbecue versus backyard. Don't make that mistake of watching competition barbecue shows and thinking you're going to repeat that process in your backyard. It's a great thing to strive for and it's fun, but don't drive yourself crazy trying to duplicate what you see on TV. As I've said before, competition barbecue is a completely whole new animal than backyard barbecue is. First of all, they're cooking for money. They're cooking under a time frame. They have to follow several, several rules uh, in order to even qualify for someone to taste that meat. They are cooking their food for what they call that one bite wow. Most of the time they're cooking a lot of food and a judge is taking one bite of it to find out. Obviously in backyard barbecue, we're eating all of our food. The myth. There's a myth that was around for decades called searing locks in the juices. That was a popular term. And I'll tell you something that's kind of an interesting story, and this is a little bit of barbecue IQ for you here, is that years ago, restaurants used to propagate that myth. They used to tell everyone that if you seared first, it locked in the juices of the meat and it made it juicier when you were done. Ironically, that's absolutely not true at all. That myth has been debunked by several top shelves such as Alton Brown and Meathead on Amazing Ribs. And there is no truth to doing a upfront sear locking in any juices. In fact, I just told you a few moments ago, a better way to do it is what's called a reverse sear and sear it at the end. You ever wondered why that restaurant steak was just so good and you just couldn't quite duplicate it? Well, that's because they were telling you to sear it up front when you should have been searing it at the end.
the myth. Oftentimes people will see red or pink in pork and poultry and think that that means that it's not done. In my previous poultry show, I told you that chicken is cooked to 165. If you're hitting temperature of 165, folks, it doesn't matter if there's a little red in there or not. In fact, when you cut deeper into the poultry, as long as you hit the correct temp, I'm going to say that again, as long as you hit the correct temp of 165, don't worry about some red juices that you find down, especially close to the bone. It's perfectly normal. It does not mean that your poultry is raw or dangerous. But once again, I will say you've tempted your meat and you know that it's at the correct USDA recommendation, which for poultry is 165, for pork is 145. The myth. The other thing people see, and I've mentioned this again, was the red liquid that they see when they buy meat or when they take it out of a package. And people think that that's blood, and it is not blood. Blood runs through the circulatory system of the animal just like us. What's your, that red liquid you're seeing is called myoglobin. It's perfectly okay to eat. It's perfectly fine to be on your meat right before it goes on the grill. There's no harm in that. If you want, you can very slightly rinse it off or you can take a paper towel and dab it and soak it up. It's not going to hurt anything. Or you can just leave it right in there. It doesn't hurt anything at all. The myth. For those of us barbecuers or those novice barbecuers out there, a lot of times you will misinterpret and see, especially on on, on TV and that, you'll see smokers in shows that just have billowing smoke coming out of them. That's actually the worst smoke you can have. The two worst types of smoke you can have in a smoker is black smoke and thick white or gray smoke. Those, those two types of smoke is going to generate a bitter taste on your food. It's technically going to ruin your food. The perfect barbecuing smoke out of a smoker is almost not even seen. It's a thin blue smoke that comes out and that is the perfect type of smoke to impart the perfect flavor. Barbecue restaurants know this. Popular and very famous pit masters all know this and that is the smoke they strive to get. You're not doing you or anyone in your neighborhood favor by having billowing smoke coming out of your smoker. The myth. Resting meat. Now, I do let meat rest typically about five to 10 minutes, but it's not for the reason that you think. One of the myths out there is every time your meat comes out, you should let it rest for a long period of time. This is really not necessary for smaller cuts. Specifically, if you're doing it with burgers and steaks, well, one, your meat can get cold if you leave it sitting on the counter for 30, 45 minutes. The reason I let meat rest for about five or 10 minutes is it's what's called carryover cook. Meat, when it's cooked, heat penetrates from the outside in. So a lot of times when you take your meat off of the smoker or out of the oven or off the grill, the surface of the meat is hotter than the internal temp of the meat. When you bring it away from heat, now it does not continue to cook. That's another myth because you're not subjecting any more heat to it. Basic science tells us for something to cook, you have to continue to apply heat. What's happening though is the inside of the meat is drawing a lot of that heat into it and it's doing it through the juices of the meat. So it is possible to pull chicken off of a grill at say 160 to 163, let it set for a few minutes, check the temp, and it's not surprising, it may be at 165. So a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that it continues to cook, when really what's happening is you have what's called carryover cook, and it's just all of the heat redistributing throughout that meat. If you leave it out, the smaller cuts on the counter, your fat can congeal, and that will kind of taste like wax. So that's another reason we don't want to let burgers or steaks sit out really much more than five or 10 minutes. You can get a soggy crust. I talked about that char you get from cooking over direct heat. Well, if you let it sit for too long, you'll lose some of that crunchiness that you get when you bite into it. And then poultry, if you've grilled or barbecued that, if you've let it sit out too long, the skin, even though you've crisped it up, can get rubbery again. So these are all a few reasons of why you don't have to let meat rest for a long period of time. A couple minutes doesn't hurt. I do that, but really more than about five, 
maybe say 10 minutes is probably too much, specifically when you're talking about small cuts of meat. Now remember, in barbecue, when we have large cuts of meats, briskets, tri-tips, things like that, it might be more prudent to let that rest longer simply because of the mass of the meat versus a smaller steak or hamburger. The myth. Another myth having to do with soaking wood is soaking wood in flavored liquids. So for example, if I, some people have made the mistake that if I soak my wood in whiskey, my barbecue or smoked foods will taste like whiskey. Chances are you won't pick up that flavor at all. Remember, that liquid is vaporizing before that wood smokes anyway. So you've probably got rid of most of it before the wood even starts to smoke. So I think you're wasting your time, folks, by soaking wood in wine or beer, or it always seems to be alcohol, or maybe a marinade or something like that. Again, if you've tried it and you like it, then please, by all means, keep doing it. But if you're thinking about trying it, give it a try. But I don't know that you're going to find a huge difference. The myth. Beer can chicken during my poultry segment. And you can always go back and listen to that to hear what I said about beer can chicken. I call it vertical chicken cooking. Although I am a fan of vertical chicken cooking, which means standing the chicken up, I am not a fan of putting liquid in whatever stand it's on. In beer can chicken, the premise is you open a beer, you pour a little bit out, you stick that beer up the cavity of the chicken and let it stand on the grill and cook, thinking that the beer is imparting a flavor. And I'm here to tell you it does not, folks. In order for that any liquid to impart a flavor, it would have to steam. And then remember, for liquid to steam at our elevation, that's got to be somewhere between 195 and about 200. And if you're at that temp inside that chicken, I hate to tell you, but your breaths are probably shot at that point. The myth. There is something called the stall that I've talked about in the past where meat goes through an evaporative cooling process. Some people think that it's due to other reasons or it's a breakdown of connective tissue. It is simply the meat going through evaporative cooling and your human body does it. When you overheat, you start to sweat and it's just a way for your body to try to cool down. The membrane on ribs, I do teach to remove it. I don't think it's a big deal to remove it, but I would never tell anyone that it would it would block any flavor because most smoke, flavor, things like that will penetrate that membrane. Uh, I don't think you have to really worry about it. Most restaurants leave it on. I went over that during my, my rib segment in the past. The myth. One last myth I'll go over before we wrap up the show is fat cap up or down. A fat cap can be on pork it can be on beef and the myth is if you put the fat cap up that the heat will start to dissolve the fat it'll run into the tissues of the meat and make it moist and that's absolutely not true the muscle fibers of beef is so wound tight inside that there is no moisture getting inside that already exists it might run over the meat but it will not moisturize the meat at all Folks, thanks for listening to today's segment of Barbecue Mess on Easy Does It Barbecue, brought to you by Colorado Barbecue Outfitters. My name is Dan McDonald. Colorado Barbecue Outfitters is located at 5921 North Academy Boulevard, which is the northeast corner of Vickers and Academy. Come in to ask us any questions you have. I carry all of the items I mentioned in today's show and would love to have you come by or drop me a line or send me an email. I'll answer any questions you have. Remember, we call it Easy Does It Barbecue because if it's not easy, you're working too hard. See you next week, everybody. Thanks for listening to Easy Does It Barbecue, brought to you by Colorado Barbecue Outfitters, specializing in pellet grills, charcoal grills, electric smokers, sauces, rubs, and barbecue accessories. Online at 719BBQ.com. See you next Saturday at 1 for Easy Does It Barbecue. And listen to the podcast on Podbean. 